Welcome again, everyone, to TNS Radio Ireland. You're listening to Mike Montagna, original 1968 architect of Mathematically Perfected Economy, speaking on Mathematically Perfected Economy and Absolute Consensual Representation. Original material, analyses, and solution, as always, are copyright and trademark by yours truly. All rights and therefore claims of authority are reserved. Archives of this program can be downloaded freely from perfecteconomy.org slash FTP. Copies can be distributed freely only so long as the entirety of this program, including this copyright and trademark notice, remain intact. I just got off the air with uh, Larry B. Graff, constitutional attorney here in the States, uh, had an hour interview. Uh, Unfortunately, a fellow who uh, had no idea what uh, the process of monetization uh, is and how this sleight of hand worked uh, got all involved in our interview and uh, frankly it was uh, one of the most uh, incoherent uh, discussions I've had in a in a long time, so I'm a little bit disturbed by that. Uh, as I think I should be, uh, <laughs> today's my uh, my 60th birthday. That means I've been doing this for 44 years now, and uh, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> This is like that, uh, you know, that little trick you saw probably if you saw the, the movie Robin Hood where the three cups have a pea under the cup and the magician moves them around and you guess which cup the pea is under. You have a one in three chance, so the odds are, you know, if people are gambling or weighted in favor of the, the, uh, the host of the trick. <clears throat> Economy is a trick as well, and uh, the main reason for the interview, which I just did, was to answer the question: What is the, you know, the most important problem of the world today? And and unfortunately, I, <laughs> you know, after going through an experience like I just did. Uh, it's it's very uncomfortably plain that I don't know what's wrong with people uh, that they can't focus when a credible speaker unravels the issues for them and there's their interest in their own misconceptions or ego or whatever are are such that they immediately have to re paraphrase everything that you're carefully articulating in the most exacting terms because that's the only way that we can understand which cup that P ends up under. And you see, well, I have this move, and the cups go like this. And every time you think that this cup exits this direction, it's actually staying under the other hand, which has curled this other cup around into that path. So it appears that I've moved the cup that I moved under that hand, but I haven't, you see. And so you think that the P is going over here, over here, over here. And it's not. It didn't move at all. You know, it's only when you explain the trick that you can understand it. Then you can watch the trick carefully and you can see, lo and behold, that's exactly what he's doing. That's a great thing because he has a way of hiding where that P is going to be so that I truly, at least, have to guess it, at least. Well, economy is an obfuscation as of our, our currency. And we've had our little tiffs here on the, you know, the the... TNS uh, between different broadcasters, some of them gone now, 
who have decided that they understood this and they would peddle a, a way to um, to skate on your debts to the banking system. And then you don't even have to understand what the obfuscation is and somehow you're going to go into well what may not even be technically at least from our own perspective courts of law that is their their slanted plain fields which in, by which lies are perpetrated against us so that the truth can't come out and can't prevail in our behave in in our behest in in or behalf in such a way that uh, our debts are resolved not to zero but to what they ought to be i mean after all what court of law is going to uphold some position of a purported debtor who claims well, because the bank does something, and I don't even have to explain what that is, the debt isn't really owed to the bank, and I don't have to explain how that is, and the court is just supposed to understand it, because it seems to be so, to me at least, and therefore we can survive our foreclosure. Our debts are resolved. I borrowed $100,000 into circulation to pay for a $100,000 home, and now though I've maybe paid $20,000 of the principal off, I just don't own the, owe the rest. Well, obviously a court isn't going to understand that that's rightful, because it isn't rightful that we could just borrow money into circulation to buy whatever we want and never pay it back, you see. Because in truth, what money needs to re represent is our own contributions to the pool of wealth. In other words, what, what our contributions to production are. That's what money is. If I hold money, it says, I did so much work that someone of you decided was worth so much. And they have given it the nod then that I spend it as I want amongst what wealth exists here. And it's vital then that the volume of the circulation equals all the wealth that can be represented by it because otherwise there's a competition for money or property which, which itself corrupts the value of one or the other so that what I spend of what I've contributed doesn't render unto me what I have contributed or its equal. So this is the basic problem that we're resolving when we when we perfect an economy. What perfecting an economy is then is a perfection of a monetary process. That is how is money created and how does it retire from existence. What is its lifespan? And that's all that mathematically perfected economy is. It's a, it's a uh, replication of the natural life cycle of promissory obligations which only represent value so long as they represent an obligation to uh, deliver production to the overall pool of wealth. So on a earlier program months ago uh, I explained, uh, I read uh, actually uh, a, 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 an early essay of mine, uh, 1975 essay, uh, Parable of Perfect Economy. And uh, I spoke to Vin about this the other day, and uh, I think he looked forward to my explaining the meaning of the parable further, because although its examples are, are very definitive and, and, and clear, um, people don't understand them. And, uh, much of the work on the new web presence that I'm 
been putting together and Mark Giles is so graciously offered to host uh, and make all this possible that we host a worldwide mandate for mathematically perfected economy and absolute consensual representation. This uh, this new site, uh, it, 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 it's, it's more than a lifetime of work for most programmers. I'm generally a substantial team of people would tackle something like this but what's really holding me up is is uh, I could probably explain it in in regard to yesterday's experience uh, I didn't do any work I, I worked 15 16 17 hours a day seven days a week on this and I didn't get anything done uh, yesterday at all uh, because all of a sudden I had a, a deluge of um, of good attention from a, a diversity of places, which required that um, that I explain a great number of, of issues to several, quite a number of people. I mean, I actually got about 100 emails in just about a, maybe an hour, which kept me at the answers the whole day. And uh, curiously, uh, when in fact I ended up wasting the day, sort of, it's not really truly a waste because these people were earnestly interested in the answers, but what I spent the day at was uh, was answering questions that, of course, I've, I've, I've answered literally thousands of times, which in the end came back for quite a number of these people to again this parable of perfect economy what I've been doing on the for the website then is um, I actually have something like we might just say depending on what we want to include in the set or not but let's just say a half a dozen articles that I've been working on is the more or less answer all document for us to refer to that we understand these issues. Now, some people have some kind of idea that who is Mike Montagna? Uh, who is he to answer questions that we might have any opinion about? And why is his opinion any better than ours? Why should we have any interest at all in a, in a word he says? Isn't he just arrogant to think that he has the answer and and when we all know that money is created out of thin air well in truth you don't know that money is created out of thin air it's a preposterous statement it's not how money is created at all the fact of the matter is that in any mathematic riddle there is one and one only correct answer there always has been there always will be. And so it's vital for us to understand how the answer is developed in order to understand, in fact, that it is an answer. Anyone who is a credible authority answering to any mathematic riddle will give you the answer in that very form. Why? Otherwise, we're just a, uh, you know, uh, uh, a loose conglomeration of people uh, asserting this and counter-asserting that and asserting anything else. And it's all just as good as anything else. The answer to these questions is not a matter of opinion. The question is, is whether or not the answer that I gave so long ago is indeed the answer. That's all. If not... You're listening to the wrong show. So this is one reason I don't appreciate it when somebody comes, you know, into a forum and, and you know, and they, they, they think they've given quality time. They have no idea what at all what, what kind of work goes behind developing an answer so clearly that in truth, from the arguments that develop it, the answer is indisputable. It doesn't mean that people won't dispute, because people will dispute anything 
who don't understand what is a fact and what is not a fact. As I say, the matter is not a matter of opinion. And until we realize that, we are never going to fix the world. Is it a good thing? Is it possible even that we can just throw different uh, opinions at each other as if somehow we are correct despite the fact that those opinions not only conflict with each other but contradict each other and don't even identify the only principles by which we can resolve the answer. These are things that any diligent person ultimately comes to understand at some time in their life. The earlier the better because then life is more or less calmed down to a stable and fertile environment where a person speaks when they've done the diligence to develop the answer. They don't tire us with, oh, I want to say something else that's different. And so I just went through this this other program and I, you know, forgive me if it's too heavily on my mind, but uh, frankly, uh, I just, I, 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 I can't hardly believe that, you know, I, I'm, you know, I turned 60 today and, and, and people who haven't the slightest idea, even what I just said to them, because they weren't even listening to it, they were deciding something else existed and they just wanted to butt in, you know, and they don't have the slightest idea what they're about to say. <laughs> that it's actually just plain stupid, you know. And yet, to paraphrase me as if I'd said it, to turn it into a question, I mean, I literally hung up on this interview and I'm disgusted by it. Uh, because uh, here I am, you know, after. <laughs> uh, pretty much the same experience with our, you know, our, uh, our fertile chat room, uh, where the answers to the, you know, the world's problems are after all, you know, resolved. And, you know, what are we going to do but spin our wheels um, unless we resolve these things? So today's program uh is for those who want to listen and to listen carefully. The rest of you, I, I think, could, you know, watch football or something like that because uh, what I'm going to do today is, is uh, it vented, you know, explain to people that I was going to do this, and I'm actually, uh, I haven't had time to finish the essay that I wanted to read today and go over it to teach its its meaning. What's happened is uh, um, I, I wanted to develop a answer all document for the website and I had worked on a half a dozen different documents, just an inordinate amount of work to get all these issues down to the, you know, the simplest possible form and it just it seems like no matter how you go through them because a person just doesn't want to think that there should be any work involved in 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 understanding solution you lose people and after i i spent months many months on these half dozen articles um i returned to this 1975 essay and i instead decided to rewrite it, that is, uh, put some touches on it, which um, some things I had purposely left out before, and you'll understand why at the conclusion of the program. Um, I had other reasons for leaving out other things, which um, I intended um, to provide in a sort of uh, simpler form that I could you know, expand upon later at other times. Um, so 
I discussed this with Vin and he thought it was a good idea and and uh, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to read the current state of this document parable of perfect economy <clears throat> now as I explained it's gone through a number of permutations in time and I've only just mentioned that I haven't really explained it this permutation it, it may or may not be its final form but I've renamed it parable of mathematically perfected economy <clears throat> there's a reason that I've done this which can only be understood at the end of the document as well otherwise it seems insignificant so this reading is parable of mathematically perfected economy now those of you who heard the earlier broadcast or, or who have have um, I'm getting called by people excuse me um, uh, those of you who've uh, um, either read the document or heard the earlier broadcast you're aware that it's it, it, it revolves around the colonial history of America many of you are Europeans I've got people listening in Australia you know from all over the world um, I want to make clear first of all that the story although it's in an American setting is not at all about America and that's really what the importance of the story is it's about everywhere what this story does is it gets at the throat of all the issues which are at hand now these are the things we have to put into perspective about the current governments of the world and how we are dealing with whatever we are whatever we're dealing with is unveiled by this story as well now, this essay you won't understand as yet is actually one of the most plagiarized monetary essays in history this and my uh, analyses of Benjamin Franklin's essay uh, modest inquiry into the nature and necessity of a paper currency have actually been plagiarized more than 25 million times but when I give this account I would like you to think of it in the terms of yourselves in your own countries what we're confronting in the way of abusive governments because it's all these nuances of our present situation expressed as if it's from another time which are the meaning of this story so only by paying careful attention to it can we understand it very deeply at all and that's meant itself to make us want to understand it all the more deeply is conflict boiled into revolution Benjamin Franklin sailed for England hoping to inspire restraint in virtually irreversible abuses of power without accountability to the governed Americans could only hope for mitigation of mounting costs which were perpetually exacerbated by the increasing expense of enforcing ever more excessive taxations upon an ever more resistant public the American effort therefore was inevitably met by evasion because no worthy defense exists for any government which takes more than it may plainly claim to offer plaintiffs 
may thus be censored from openly asserting any given crime to their oppressor. But neither may they argue effectively for compromise, because it is never some temporary fraction, but the nature and thus the very whole of oppression, which are always at stake. Because oppression can never tolerate a full account of its crimes against us, <clears throat> ensuing events would inevitably chronicle how dispossession for the sake of dispossession rarely concedes either means or extent, not only because exposure to appeal abandons an irrecusable denial of accountability, but because indeed enforcement depends upon ever more massive taking. Franklin's mission inherently unfolds, therefore, with prospective costs of restraint falling upon perpetrators who can hardly afford to dismantle the very means for persisting in every intended sin. As the costs of enforcing wrong thus increase every intended breach of power, breach would heap further breach and cost upon its victims in a proliferation which inevitably abandons every tenet of just possession. Because an intentionally corrupt government, therefore, can never truly heed appeals for justice, every persistent, purposed abuse of power eventually manifests in an inversion of justice, which instead preserves every premeditated crime against the people. While every purpose denial of representation may therefore achieve its goals by any necessary combination of division, threat of force, unwarranted dispossession, incarceration, political deception, wantful breach of political promise or duty, ambitious coercion or gradual accumulation. Nonetheless, adverse intentions are always marked at least by evasion, because evasion is indispensable not only to minimizing the risks of apprehension, but to the furtherance of purposed crime by the least provocative of its ever volatile means. Intentional abuse thus signals its own most critical weaknesses. In a marked fact, it must draw the naive to reinforce their own destruction. Without the ascent of hapless, self-destructive masses, abuse of power has no chance. Mass, veritable awakening, there, awakening therefore, is the oppressed's only salvation because their cause must have a solution worthy of unbreakable union if they are to prevail over any well-entrenched opposition. Thus with evasion sustaining oppression's necessary deceptions, evasion reigns over every man-made problem we would solve by little more than eradicating the responsible abuse. Amidst just such events, then, Franklin teaches far more than perfected monetary process, because his fledgling diplomacy warned eternity how purposed divestiture intends to survive even the most deserving arguments against it. These then were the circumstances of an inevitable revolution in which, in, in which premeditated sins would never bend 
to a call for justice they had already purposely abandoned. Every political scheme for vast exploitation, therefore, depends upon a licensing and distribution of the spoils of an inevitably exhaustive, destructive proliferation of greed. Yet it must succeed in its objects while every fact of unwarranted exploitation is both ever evident and entirely antithetical to true freedom, justice, and consensual rule. Thus nothing less than absolutely impervious representative process can revert an orchestrated denial of representation because every way to deviate from representation otherwise sustains subversion. Certainly then America's mere complaint would be futile because only a people who are wholly prepared and willing to so revise their government can ever free themselves from seated oppression. Amidst even the most distant and challenging possibility of justice, therefore, contest is inevitable in every denial of right, because only against a complete, absolute, and permanent extinguishing of hope might we give up everything human. Such an unwarranted perpetual surrender, however, is virtually impossible, merely because one day at least one of us will refuse to abandon a course to solution which will inevitably gain many, many, many allies. Until every better person stands in their own rightful lot. Thus a contest of vast and extreme servitude is the most probable and expensive to persist in not only because it is the most likely to escalate maximal duress, but because its objects ultimately saddle exceeding costs of suppression upon the multitudes it ultimately condemns to dare. Unless it is dissolved by inherent designs of the people, then, substantial exploitation inevitably escalates its injustices beyond all reasonable hope for further toleration. As its means thus become the steepest price for ever more and ever heavier chains, thus the pronounced intentional subjugation of America could never have granted Franklin's mere appeal the self-perpetuating escalation simply be reduced to some inevitably arbitrary, faulted, and temporary extent. These inertias would instead force defiance of an abusive, inherently irresponsive power, rising at it, as it might at any time amidst any people who deny themselves any vital means for securing real justice. For indeed, only an omission of restrictive means which can prove our undoing. Inevitable, yet less comprehensive reorganizations of government would thus discourage only some of the crimes the colonists suffered. Yet as our own history, therefore, would soon record, not even the very worst of these would disappear, not even for a while. There is far more to resolve from the Founder's allegory, then, if we are to write our own day. That's the introduction. The next subsection is titled Franklin Schools, the Ruling Class, Britain. As much as they suffered under an unassented government to whom they would now appeal, still the Americans were already prominent manufacturers and traders whose prosperity was thus far the less of what they would have enjoyed otherwise. No one, of course, would know this more bitterly than the victims 
Understandably, then, in the likely hope of a final end to unnecessary hardship, already the speedy and well-navigated vessels they happen to develop enable an exceedingly independent people to become equally skillful evaders of the many excessive duties which were routinely imposed without the familiar requisite they were now about to demand, representation. As the inertias of the time came to a boil then, the most insightful Americans rose in unity, first employing diplomacy to demand recognition of principles which, given their way, would inevitably manifest instead in universal justice. Thus we must fully understand both the capabilities of the emissary and the conditions he would be confronted with if we are to truly understand his loosely defined mission. Franklin, of course, was already a renowned author, publisher, scientist, philosopher, and statesman, and so there was tremendous anticipation of his arrival. The prospect he would be greeted by an entirely congenial, benefiting audi audience, however, was certainly improbable. For the subjects or prevailing class of each environment as they were, either grew as a matter of the tangible fruits of independent enterprise, or they resisted just reward in the course of a participatory oppression in which overall prosperity was purposely impeded, that by substantial denial, manipulation, and unearned taking, a few might reap the relatively little which can be produced despite pervasive adversity. The fundamental purpose of the resultant oppressor class was merely to take, and the competitive, ever unfettered exercise of this purpose, therefore, would inherently encompass the greatest possible and least justifiable excesses of actual contribution to an overall pool of wealth. A class of takers thus accomplished all this by little more than denying the subservient any possibility of sustaining themselves otherwise. And thus, as much as the colonists expected independence, and as much as their English cousins expected subjugation, infectious conceptualizations of justice were routinely and even vindictively suppressed across the breadth of Franklin's destination, most particularly by the audience he would soon stand before. In England, too, the little news from the colonies was passed largely by disreputable sailors. Most often, this transpired in even more disreputable places. As a matter of course, little, understandably, was believed of the tales told, and so it was largely presumed that Franklin's remarkable reputation was merely exaggerated. It was anticipated, therefore, that his forthcoming visit, whatever the purposes, would ultimately prove Mr. Franklin a relatively uncultured disappointment. If a country could be represented by the arrogance of a few, England expected in Franklin no more than an underdeveloped woodsman, hardly fit to duly represent his peers before purported dignitaries of a self-assumed far higher land. Their encounter, however, would prove Mr. Franklin far ahead of their time, for his distinguished answers would soon change the world. Virtually upon his arrival, the worldly underestimated Benjamin Franklin was swept from a trying voyage to a prominent engagement 
to which the heart of justice would be no treasured guest. There, before the ruling class of England, the guest of honor was soon compelled to make the, the usual unprepared speech. Amidst much ado, Franklin, yielding to a chorus of universal request, laboriously made his way through the very crowded house, whereupon, finally reaching the podium, he bothered for quite some while to adjust a curious spare pair of of spectacles. These, in the very style of all that was to unfold, just happened to be his own invention. Finally, having made his way through all the commotion, having cleared his unique glasses, there the supposed mere woodsman stood for quite some further while, attentively surveying his audience. Thinking somewhat undecidedly what to speak about, instead he thought it more polite and accountable to ask. Thus the first public words of Benjamin Franklin in this mission were finally, What's your pleasure? The audience shouted anxiously to describe the colonies. Franklin knew well of English affairs and conditions. He knew particularly, for instance, that even prominent lawyers spent a good part of the year behind on their rent, that they often went hungry, that few non-aristocrats owned property, that many, many people suffered from poor diet, that the common, exceedingly impoverished citizen spent their life hoping to no more than outpace imposing debt. Britain was itself largely comprised of the oppressed, who in turn were largely no more than hopeful of rewarding employment. The virtually universal condition was subservience, rewarded by constant, intentional, dire need. All this being as it was, Franklin, therefore, was naturally inclined to convey the relatively hopeful state of the colonies. Thus he began his answer with what in retrospect is certainly a remarkable report. Very well, he said. As the room quieted, Franklin conjured their hypothetical first glimpse of the new world, finally engaging in what he intended to be a casual account. You can leave your ship with just your baggage. Walk beyond the furthest homestead and become an immediate landowner. Such an uproar immediately erupted upon his first sentence that it was impossible to continue. Of their own self-imposed necessity, England's ruling elite characteristically censored every threat to their preposterous dominion. The more potent the hope, the more imperative their need to extinguish it. Their rage thus stemmed from a warranted fear that a real hope of independent prosperity would destroy their very means to sustain an ever undeserved status by customary divestment of right, property, resources, and means of production. A real promise of bountiful general opportunity in America would only spell the end of purposed oppression. Seeing all this, Franklin was neither disturbed nor offended by the assaults of their obvious hypocrisy, and thus he would eventually continue without replying otherwise to the interruption, 
but to speak more deliberately to their otherwise unimportant disposition. His resumption, therefore, would be a rebuttal, and the longer he was willing to wait with patient dig dignity, the more earnestly they wanted to further renounce what they could never tolerate. Thus Franklin announced his rebuttal with a single stinging word. Furthermore, was all he said for a seeming eternity. Having reacquired their fullest attention, he continued an account in which every plodding sentence was an oppressor's mortal worm wound. The forests are far more vast than you would likely ever imagine. Anyone may cut down all the trees they want to build whatever kind of home they might please. An endless wilderness is so rich in game and the rivers and coasts are so teeming with fish that a shortage of meat would be impossible. A person may clear far more land than they could ever even harvest, and the soil is so rich and fertile that vast excess crops grow with the greatest vitality. Unspoiled streams are everywhere. Their waters are pure and good, and so plentiful that whatever we may need may be diverted to irrigate fields or power thriving industries. The people, therefore, are indeed very happy, busy, and prosperous. End of brief account. Raucous disclaim erupted until the loudest question forced Franklin to corroborate a simple fact by instead negotiating all the untouchable prejudice at hand. How can you possibly account for the prosperity in the colonies? The requisites of the question were overt hypocrisy not only because it was impossible to answer likewise for the artificially impoverished condition of Britain, but because facts are never disproven simply by imposing artificial difficulties upon accounting for them. Genuine concern wants to understand. England's artificially wealthy merely opposed an idea which was devastating to their undeserved wealth, that what each person contributes to the sum of prosperity is the very extent to which they indeed deserve to prosper. Their wealth was jeopardized by this idea only because a purposed duplism accepted them from the deprivation they imposed upon all others. The appellant therefore sought only to require such a redundant and elaborate explanation that a common ulterior motive could falsely claim to defeat Franklin's simple and truthful account only by hypocritically repudiating any further inherently concurring fact, ulterior motives will misconstrue. The challenge tacitly warned that unwarranted power would make it impossible to persist in a prosperity which until then Britain was not even truly aware the colonies produced. While Britain's purported elite would therefore deny the original account only to censor its moment. Yet England would certainly acknowledge both the fact and possibility of prosperity and even threatening 
to dispossess the colonies of the very same. Thus, as any student of true history would anticipate, a whole building of betrayers rumbled with approval. The antagonist was a prominent banker, and his question intended to draw ranks of lords married eternally to his favor and credit, that for their daily reward they would nod approvingly to the preposterous implicit notion no other place could possibly prosper beyond Britain's inherently exhaustive deprivation. After all, long entrenched customs compromised the wealth of Britain's entirety, not for justice, but to, to divert it, but to divert it to an undeserving few, that vast deprivation of the people in the hands of parasites could sustain an otherwise unjustifiably blind, corrupt, and underachieving nation. The banker would therefore have his way, and thus a dire allegiance to impairment would celebrate its appalling need to extinguish prosperity, knowing perfectly well that in the alternate case, just reward would extinguish its ever undeserved status. So united were the betrayers in this purpose that without even a signal, the room hushed to ambush whatever Franklin's answer. They expected Franklin to rejoin the heretical position by recanting, by perjuring forth the confession that the toil and unmitigated opportunities of the colonies could certainly prosper no more than the mitigated toil and opportunity of Britain itself. Yet the uncultivated speaker simply waited for absolute silence. Thus to the mounting distress of a class which never toils, Franklin instead began to answer the question with absolute conviction. It's quite simple, he calmly began, pausing to study the most agitated among them. As Franklin engaged confounded stares without raising even a whispered tort, his few suspended words were at least implicitly disarming. The pompous lords of Britain palpably anticipated a response which still would exceed their worst expectations. After all, why would even a fool answer such stubborn intended irreverence unless he were well prepared to thwart their intended suppression. There was of course a seeming absence of offensive substance in the three words and there was Franklin's surprisingly defiant conviction against such outraged numbers. Yet the expression intentionally forebode a far more debilitating difficulty to argue the contrary, that prosperity is indeed so inherently complex that in every country it should depend upon a separate class of takers who produce nothing to divest the vast majority into past, present, and future oblivion. Franklin saw already that we were plainly condemned to war and separation. He was suddenly no longer an Englishman. And so, still marveling at their malfeasance, he therefore finished introducing his answer with a defiant provocation intended to mortify every hypocrite in the house. We 
have created our own currency. The expected altercation erupted, angrily demanding full accountability. By his own wish then, Franklin would reprimand betrayers of the fact true prosperity descends strictly from the just rewards of truly free enterprise, all of which is sustained by a singular tenet of monetary justice. History is forgotten now that at only 23 Franklin had envisioned, resolved, and prescribed a mathematically perfected economy. In his 1729 essay, Nature and Necessity of a Paper Currency, Franklin had proven a fact of one and one only just, naturally sustained, mathematically perfected economy. The only way such a fact could be developed was paved by first determining that the only prospective powers to inflict monetary injustice acted only by corrupting either the volume or the disposition of currency. A mathematic categorization of prospective faults derived from the only potentially aberrant powers of a currency therefore made it possible to prove a monetary solution. This was a substantial innovation because otherwise it is impossible to account for potentially infinite distinct cases. In perfecting economy, therefore, we were dealing with either volume or disposition of a circulation, or both. Franklin's volumetric improprieties therefore corresponded to the modern concepts of circulatory inflation and deflation, which of course are defined as either increases or decreases in the volume of circulation per represented property. Franklin's dispositional improprieties, on the other hand, correspond to the present perpetual multiplication of debt by interest. If unwarranted processes perpetually multiply debt in proportion to a circulation, for example, as Franklin found, Franklin saw that ever more of a circulation was dedicated to servicing the escalation of debt as opposed to sustaining intended industry and commerce. Franklin thus called this impropriety maldisposition. Now therefore a long-standing proof of a singular answer to every monetary question had sent Franklin before bankers to defeat a myriad of ancient lies cloaked in virtually infinite permutation. Because these purposed permutations were the inevitable basis for the world's first central banks, Franklin had likewise finally unraveled the ancient ruse of the money changer. In his findings, the expression finally gave up its meaning a meaning it could never have otherwise. Ages had suffered the severe consequences of a wholly unnatural dependence upon banking systems. Always the suffering country took the course it did, not only without warrant, but even without general assent. It did this likewise by the most subversive deceptions, for the ancient stratagem survives history virtually unfathomed, in part because its sleight of hand must be distilled to deeply buried roots before even the first of us will ever apprehend 
that it is all together physically, rationally, and legally impossible to borrow into circulation what is not even possessed. So long as even just a few men can be so wicked then, the rest of us must, must follow the very whole of Franklin's path before our society can understand that there is one and one only way to save ourselves from monetary predation. A society which won't, on the other hand, therefore condemns itself to terminal dispossession. By unraveling the ploy, Franklin adjudicated that because a purported banking system never gives up lawful consideration commensurable to what it pretends to loan, no commensurable debt can ever exist to a mere publisher of the currency. In any veritable, rational, or legal sense, on the contrary, because the only real creditors of any possible subject transaction are paid in full when they give up property for promissory obligations, thus each and every such contract to monetize our production inherently remains a commitment only to pay and to retire principal from circulation. Franklin, of course, had readily perceived banking's falsification of indebtedness from its, from its mere publication of further representations of our promissory obligations to each other, because he himself had long served as printer of colonial Pennsylvania's currency. Franklin had effectively proven, therefore, that a purported banking system no more than publishes the further representations of the promissory obligations we circulate merely for the sake of regularity. But as he alone had demonstrated then, it is a grievous error to simply call this money and to consider money a debt to a bank regardless of whatever facts ostensibly monetize our production. We did not borrow money from banks at all then. Banks simply print representations of money we create when we engage in our promissory obligations. Although a debt cannot therefore exist to the purported banking system, nonetheless an obligation exists to pay and to retire principal from circulation because fulfillment of the obligation remains compulsive and because fulfillment nullifies the former representation of value. Franklin found then that no risk or property was at stake and therefore that nothing would ever justify banking's imposition of interest. Franklin himself was as much a purported central bank as any central bank was. And if interest were justified, then in the currency the colonists were issuing, he was just as entitled to interest on the promissory obligations of the people as any central bank could possibly be. Our failure to understand these facts has therefore wrought our present condition. Franklin had found, therefore, that the principal object of such a purported banking system is to deny us our universal right to issue unexploited promissory obligations that it may perpetually launder principal and interest into its ever warrant, unwarranted possession for merely publishing representations of our promissory obligations. 
Banking, therefore, only obfuscates our promissory obligations to each other into falsified indebtedness to itself. Then, only as if this falsified debt represented rightful property of the purported banking system, it subjects the falsified indebtedness to purported interest. Therefore, in fact, no need whatever to purportedly borrow money ever exists. For we the people are the very and only rightful issuers of representations of our promissory obligations. Banking only persists in the ancient ruse by denying us our right to issue unexploited promissory obligations. And we are forced to seek them except in artificial deficiency engendered wholly by denying us our universal right to issue promissory obligations free of extrinsic, wholly redundant, and wholly unwarranted exploitation. Yet this universally denied right is itself both the very general right to contract and the further intrinsic right to monetize commerce by a general right to contract and to represent value warranted only by the involved parties, in all of which no extrinsic entity has any right to redundantly plunder whatever. The whole mutually exclusive proposition of banking, therefore, exists on the contrary merely to deny us these universal rights that for no more than publishing an obfuscation of money it may launder all the principal and interest of eternity into its ever unwarranted possession. Worse still, the deprivations of a central banking system are inevitably terminal because unless a purported banking system dis directly absorbed so much of our production as equated to all the principal and interest unwitting subjects pay out of their general circulation, it is impossible for the subjects even to maintain a circulation which would allow them to persist in their initial falsified obligations without perpetually borrowing further. The principal they pay out of the general circulation otherwise must be borrowed back into the general circulation, persisting therefore in any former sum of, sum of debt, and making it mathematically impossible even to make, pay down any former sum of debt unless all the interest is re reabsorbed as well. Unless the purported banking system absorbs so much as all the interest the subjects are paying out of their general possession, the sum of falsified indebted indebtedness, therefore, increases perpetually by so much as periodic interest on an ever greater sum of falsified debt until they succumb to terminal sums of falsified indebtedness, the likes of which are reflected in the present global monetary failure. This inevitable failure is inherently terminal then because it destroys creditworthiness to borrow further as remains necessary to sustain a vital circulation. Industry disappears with the circulation under a mountain of insoluble falsified debt which is readily averted by restoring our natural right to issue enforceable promissory obligations. Thus to accomplish all this, banking must also perpetually deny actual consensual representation, not just to any particular country, but instead to the entire world, for as the colonists would soon find, the potential realization of full prosperity in a tr single truly free state would inevitably bring down usury forever across the entire planet. The irrefutable fact which Franklin had just introduced to his derisive audience, therefore, <clears throat> 
was that in the absolute truth, even an obfuscated circulation is yet compromised of the promissory obligations is is, is yet comprised, excuse me rather, of, of the promissory obligations of the people, and therefore no genuine purpose at all exists for the ancient lie of banking. But indeed, to divest us of the monumental prosperity we would otherwise achieve. An understanding of all this ultimately hinges upon the fundamental propositions of promissory obligations. This was first because promissory obligations naturally and without undue cost arise naturally and without undue cost only where a lack of currency need needs to be resolved. In circumstances, therefore, which always uniformly comprised a need to pay for something as it was consumed. This was secondly because, until the obligations are fulfilled, they in turn represent immutable value in a persisting obligation to contribute so much to the general pool of wealth. Thus all this was finally because obligations to pay for property as we consume of it inherently disappear from circulation concurrent with consumption of and payment for every formerly represented property. Thus in perfect accord with the disposition and life cycle of promissory obligations, money arises without cost as it is needed in an obligation to pay for property as we consume of it by contributing to the pool of wealth from which the only true creditor receives commensurable reward. Immutability of the currency is therefore indispensable to monetary justice. Similarly, when money must retire from circulation, if the sum of the circulation is to immutably represent the remaining value of remaining property, fulfillment or payment of promissory obligations nullifies their former representation of what has been consumed. With avoided promissory obligations, therefore, naturally retiring from a circulation which perpetually represents the remaining value of all represented property by a perpetual one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one relationship between remaining circulation, remaining value of represented property, and remaining obligation to pay just so much for the remaining value of all represented property. As the value of every unexploited promissory obligation therefore becomes null and void upon fulfillment of the obligation, Franklin had noted that paid principal is always, always, always inherently retired from circulation. But all this further means, then, that never, never, never can the paid principle of a promissory obligation represent the property or further entitlement of anyone. However intentionally corrupt the laws of any land, then, the arguments of these facts would still stand in any legitimate court of law which persists in upholding contracts because these are merely the essential facts which must be sustained if any contract is ever sustained. Franklin was thus fully prepared to defend the simple truth that banking and a universal right to issue unexploited promissory obligations are mutually exclusive propositions.
with the latter necessarily eradicating every consequence of an ever-redundant lie. As publisher of Colonial Pennsylvania's currency, in fact, Franklin would himself have been what we call a central bank. Yet he had unearthed a vital fact that the purported discipline we call economics is entirely bereft of formal proof or theorem, because the only purpose and consequence of the ancient obfuscation are a perpetual escalation of entirely unwarranted dispossession by perpetual multiplication of falsified indebtedness into terminal falsified indebtedness. Thus Franklin would explain how the present world has brought itself to the brink of an ever avertible criminal and fatal artificial monetary failure. Stupefied by a lack of such explanation, the audience nonetheless would quiet and Franklin would carefully explain how capable people are forced to rectify their currency where they inevitably recognize it can only destroy them. So Franklin goes on to say then, if for instance one man raises fowl and a second raises feed and the first intends and was prepared to double his production in the next season, he might approach the second wanting him to produce the additional feed he will require. In turn, these two men agree upon how much of their production will be exchanged with each other, and their eventual contracts to deliver the represented property are enforceable promissory obligations. But it is therefore only by their own actual commitments, in the very spirit, in the very purposes, and in the very need for an immutable currency that the contracts which they indeed in fact issue are perpetually redeemable in just so much of their production. Only their issuance of these commitments then gives money any real and equally enduring value for all that a purported banking system misconstrues to be purported credit is to publish further representations of the very same promissory obligations. This is Franklin saying this to England. The people, therefore, he goes on, are inherently the only issuers of money, for only their issuance of such commitments monetizes their production, which is therefore represented and given value solely by their enforceable commitments. Neither are banks creditors, then, he says, for never do they give up commensurable consideration in obfuscating our obligations to retire fulfilled principal from circulation, when pretended banking systems falsify this obligation into debts to themselves by merely publishing further representations of our promissory obligations to each other. No, the people are the only actual issuers the only actual creditors, for they alone give up commensurable property for promissory obligations, Franklin says. Likewise then, because a purported banking system gives up no commensurable lawful consideration in falsifying indebtedness to itself, our promissory obligations remain commitments to pay and to retire principal from circulation. According to the very nature of promise, promissory obligations then. Paid principal can neither represent the wealth of anyone nor belong to anyone as such a representation because every fulfilled promissory obligation no longer represents value because the related obligation has been fulfilled. Pausing a moment, Franklin continued to a stunned oppressor class. Only the commitments of the people, therefore, comprise the value of a resultant currency. And thus, it is only by so fixing the circulation to the volume of property represented by the circulation 
that we can possibly sustain a truly immutable, perpetually redeemable currency which accomplishes these vital intended purposes bereft of any potential for injury. As we all well know, a purported banking system only publishes these further representations of our promissory obligations at negligible cost to itself and at inevitably terminal cost to unassenting subjects. Why would you then choose to suffer the redundant consequences? As every insult was thus erased, Franklin studied the silent room for anyone who might dare to answer such a legitimate question. Pausing, most of all, at the heckler glaring at him. Not even the banker would dare a contrary explanation, for every person there knew Franklin was absolutely and irrefutably right. He went on then, saying, All of us know the answer to this question. For great and inevitably terminal cost for naught is the only possible purpose of an intentionally obfuscating our currency. Yet every public must monetize its production if it is to facilitate trade, while nothing can immutably represent property, but a commitment to pay the value of the property as the property is consumed. Because only such an arrangement retires the circulation in such a way that the remaining circulation is always equal to the remaining value of all rightly represented property. Therefore, the only plausible vehicle for monetizing production is the promissory obligation, because it and it alone arises only when money is needed, and because likewise promissory obligations inherently retire from circulation with consumption of the property they formerly represented. Why then should we pay the principal multifold to an unascended entity which only issues further reproductions of our promissory obligations on their paper? How does an entity, entity which otherwise produces nothing earn or deserve some purported authority of such vast dispossession? Not a person would answer it. When a purported banking system merely absorbs the negligible cost of publishing further reproductions of our promissory obligations, how and why should the purported banking system be licensed to launder so much as all the principal it ever publishes in this way into its unwarranted possession? When the purported banking system does not even have any commensurable property at stake, why should a purported banking system be licensed to multiply the first wrong into terminal dispossession. Franklin studied the faces in the room, noticing a hand of the banker trembling. The audience was now even far less inclined to answer, for their defeat was ensured by Franklin's every word. To understand the answers to these questions, he thus continued, Consider the very case of our two agricultural producers. As their respective contracts represent enforceable obligations to deliver explicit volumes of production, and being as the result in promissory obligations, therefore, are both redeemable and interchangeable with that consumable volume of production, every such respective promissory note arising at every necessary occasion in just this way, thus serves to immutably monetize the trade of all prospective production without cost, limitation, injustice, or encumbrance. 
Their notes, therefore, may rightly be circulated as currency, for they and they alone represent an enforceable commitment which is perpetually redeemable in the very things of value they perpetually represent. It is only because the transferable right to collect is free from extrinsic exploitation that the production of others inevitably costs no more than sufficiently equivalent measures of our own production. It is only because we eradicate unwarranted exploitation, therefore, that our capacities to prosper can be realized. Thus we have the only possible truly free markets and enterprise, and neither our industry or commerce can be encumbered or exploited by maladministration or purposed subversion of the currency, for no more than paying our promissory obligations as we consume of represented property automatically results in a circulation which is always equal and redeemable in the remaining value of represented property. As I have explained in this one accountable proposition of economy then, the cultivator of the feed, for instance, may write a note against the fowl to be delivered to him, to pay for a doctor take, to take care of his family. The doctor may pay for goods with the same note at the local store. The store then will ultimately collect the fowl originally promised to the cultivator. When the production is delivered, the respective notes are fulfilled and appropriately cancelled, and the money passes from circulation. Without even a need for administration then, the circulation is perpetually regulated according to need. There is no inflation or deflation because the circulation always arises and passes with the life and consumption of the production it might represent. Neither, therefore, do we suffer perpetual multiplication of artificial sums of debt by interest imposed upon falsified debts to a purported banking system which in fact no more than publishes evidence of the very promissory obligations we indeed still issue to each other. In fact then, it is the very ability and right of the people both to issue and to transfer their promises to pay always free of unwarranted and unjustifiable exploitation, which itself makes it possible to sustain whatever prosperity we are capable of. Why do we eliminate conventional banking from this vital equation, he asks them. We issue our promissory obligations independent of banking's obfuscations, because its obfuscations force unwitting people to maintain a vital circulation by perpetual escalations of further borrowing. Forced to pay principal and purported interest out of a circulation comprised of only some remaining principal, unassenting subjects cannot even persist in servicing the initial falsified debts to the system of exploitation without perpetually borrowing principal and interest back into circulation. Principal which must be borrowed back into circulation therefore perpetually restores every prior sum of debt and makes it mathematically impossible to pay down every former sum of debt. Yet as interest borrowed back into circulation comprises further debt, Thus the sum of falsified debt increases at an inherently escalating rate of ever greater sums of periodic interest coupled to an ever greater sum of falsified debt until hapless fools suffer terminal dispossession and failure in an escalating sum of falsified indebtedness which inevitably exceeds a finite capacity to service debt. In the death throes of the fatal obfuscation, then, a sum of falsified indebtedness altogether destroys a former, former potential for industry to survive, exceeds the capacity for surviving industry to pay, 
and destroys creditworthiness for any surviving industry to purportedly borrow further. Thus, as further borrowing remains indispensable to preserving a vital circulation, the final whimpers of the defeated subjects can only be met by a disappearing circulation. It is impossible to solve the potential faults of any purported economic or monetary system, therefore, without eradicating banking. But it is absolutely imperative to eradicate banking if better people are to avert terminal destruction of their prosperity. End of presentation. Except for several gasps, the room was silent. So far had Franklin, so, how, so far had his English cousins deviated from this natural pattern that the very idea of people issuing the only possible just currency was even an affront to them. Their own thirst for taking deprived the general population both of its production and opportunity to prosper. How were they to rejoice in the end of their own improprieties? If Franklin's math was elementary and its observations were irrefutable, the banker then finally broke the disturbed quiet. That's preposterous, he finally blasted back at Franklin. How could you levy taxes or fund government with this mere scrip? Laughter and sarcasm once again filled the room. That's quite simple as well, Franklin would eventually answer. Suppose we have townships on opposing sides of a river and that at times it is impossible either to, either to navigate or to ford the waterway. One of these townships might build a lumber mill. The other builds a grist mill. Foreseeing eventual needs to support activity above initial demands, each township builds their mill to greater capacities than first required. As each township needs the services of the other's mill, eventually it is proposed to build a bridge across the river. Builders then agree to stipulated standards, and when the public and the builders agree upon reasonable fees, we likewise create the necessary notes and simply pay for the bridge. As the increased commerce requires the increased circulation to sustain it, there is no inflation. Thus we sustain desired industry and prosperity without any cost to the people whatever. To fund the proper services of government, such as the creation of this bridge, no need even exists to levy taxes or to subject ourselves to terminal escalations of indebtedness to mere publishers of the promissory obligations of the people. We, therefore, provide the only real and justifiable services of government entirely without cost. Blood would be shed for his excellent explanation. Benjamin Franklin, of course, was himself commissioned to print the colonial currency of Pennsylvania. And so he was perfectly aware he wasn't entitled to the principle he only published on behalf of the people. Likewise, Franklin understood that neither was he entitled or even inclined to claim interest, for like the purported banking system, neither was any commensurable property of Franklin's at stake. Thus he clearly understood the purpose deceptions of banking, only contend that a risk which doesn't even exist somehow justifies interest. <clears throat> 
The obfuscations of banking, therefore, were inherently preposterous to Benjamin Franklin. Yet his heckler not only happened to be a high-ranking officer of the Bank of England, the banker furthermore happened to be seated with several officers of Parliament. Common sense would thus anticipate the remainder of events. The following day, Parliament passed a resolution outlawing colonial scrip as currency. Without any real justification whatever, for it is impossible to justify the obfuscation, the future Americans were required to turn in their promissory obligations for notes issued by the Bank of England. Their obligations to retire payments of principal from circulation, therefore, were obfuscated into falsified debts to a purported bank. The purported bank would give up no consideration commensurable to the debts it falsified, nor would it have any commensurable property at stake, and thus the Americans would be compelled to perpetually borrow principal and interest back into a vital circulation with a sum of falsified debt perpetually increasing until they would succumb to a terminal falsification of indebtedness. Interest, therefore, would regulate the rate of failure and immediately they would be compelled to pay nearly 30% annually against the imposed false indebtedness. Franklin himself would be compelled to return with this terrible news to a people who thereafter would consider themselves separated by the magnitude of the crimes against them. Facing the risks of certain military conflict, our forebearers refused subservience that their best efforts might forge what have proven to be subvertible conduits of representation. Down the road they paved, we were to seal representation as time proved fitting. Nomenclature gives away the inertias which either destroy freedom or let it wither away. Pretending to be a Bank of England, the House of Rothschild would conscript Hessian mercenaries to subdue colonial resistance. Washington's famous winter crossing of the Delaware would therefore defeat Hessians encamped at Trenton, taking the least wage that money changers might rule a world condemned to lesser wages. Banking would transform the promissory obligations of the people into irreversible escalations of dispossession. Yet even to banking's innumerable victims, the terminal processes of this aversion would still be money. The lie might not be spelled out in some magical, ever-present ten words, which the hapless would assimilate entirely without effort. But the revelation of banking is ever evident. In effect, the people are forced to borrow their own promissory obligations into existence. Yet the obfuscations of banking are likewise evident in the ever obvious fact that our own paper, duly representing our promissory obligations, would readily sustain our every object. For banking, therefore, men would slay other men. The coerced would ensure their own destruction for a pittance that the opposing side might, might be divested likewise. Revolutionaries were thus compelled either to survive or to be extinguished by those they sought to free as well. 
Under the lie of banking, economy could only morph into the very antithesis of freedom from, re from redundant cost. If the most fundamentally corrupt lie of all was to survive, that banking serves us, our very terminology had to become a lie. In the lie of economy, usury is ostensibly justified by an incomprehensible redefinition of interest. The lie of interest itself pretends that specific bounds of an inherently terminal process are somehow conducive to truly free, self-determined people. Yet even a process for determining this preposterous notion is cited. And to say, excuse me, not even a process for determining this preposterous notion is cited. Yet the revised word never justifies the printer of money acquiring the principle. Nor is it possible to prove the publisher of evidence of our promissory obligations ever risks the principle, as is only said to justify interest. Thus, as we are only said to borrow representations of our own promissory obligations into existence, purportedly conducive rates of interest multiply falsified indebtedness into terminal dispossession all in the purported stead of usury. In the resultant lie of free enterprise, dispossession is paraded even as daily proof of the vitality of the dispossessed. That is, the profits of the banking system are added to our gross domestic product. <laughs> lie after lie, therefore, will spill therefore will spill forth so long as banking exists. And so we must be denied every occasion not only to verify or to approve the lies, which of course would entail examination, but most of all to give them the diligence which instead would invalidate them. Thus however we may or may not find better time for our own affairs. It will remain impossible for any public to maintain a vital circulation of banking's obfuscated currency without perpetually borrowing principal back into circulation as persists in every prior sum of falsified indebtedness. And without borrowing interest back into circulation as increases every prior sum of falsified debt with the very rate of ever unwarranted interest regulating our very rate of disintegration. The oppressor's military campaign would fail, but the banks which had been established in America would remain, and they would succeed in what subservient men can never accomplish by attempting to bury better men with bullets, artillery, or shovels. Banking would itself take down every vulnerable country because its treason is enforced by taking virtually everything better people can ever produce. Until 1913, attempts to eternalize usury in America were barely thwarted by the more illuminated leaders of the young nation. From the eve of December 23rd of that year on, the most significant problems of the world would be man-made. Banking's obfuscation would precipitate in terminal global disposition just 15 years after the lie of banking promised to solve what it can only cause. Yet again and again, it would be raised from its very own grave at further cost to the very publics it can only bankrupt. In the style of all things which must be named what they are not then, the private central bank which would be imposed upon the United States would, would be called the Federal Reserve. The lie would be neither federal nor a reserve of anything and global dispossession would be its only power and legacy.
During the American Revolution, European monarchies shuddered in fear before the infectious idea of an emerging world state. Britain effectively sent armies against formative concepts because they dared answer the hopes of an eventual free world. No European could openly favor the colonial battle for universal human rights. Mere contact with the colonies, however careful and politically inert, put potentially tempted lives in imminent danger. Friendships, however deep, were at least temporarily cut off, lest what usually passes between friends venture forbidden material. After the war, Benjamin Franklin wrote a friend in France hoping to resume relations. He said, We would gladly have borne the little tax on tea and other matters had they not denied us our own money. This immediately caused great unemployment and practically all our dissatisfaction. Within the year, the poor houses were filled. The hungry and homeless walked the streets everywhere. Franklin therefore recorded the actual cause of revolution that we would inevitably end banking forever. End of story. It used to have an addendum. I have an unfinished epilogue which I'm I'm not going to read. I might read a, a paragraph or two of it here just to give you an idea where it's headed. <clears throat> Any reasonably cultivated person would be repulsed by an eleventh hour deluge of irreverent monetary propositions, routinely stealing from a long-standing proof of singular solution only to prevaricate a false authority to devi deviate from its only determinate findings all to proffer dilettantes only by compromising the only impetus and means for solving a similarly man-made inherently terminal global monetary failure. Ellen Hodgson Brown for example referred to Franklin's perceptions in which he quite inaccurately called the Pennsylvania currency praising its monetary pattern as the most brilliant banking model in history. Yet however brilliant a singular solution for all monetary injustice would remain, Franklin's account is no model for banking at all. Its whole deposition preaches instead that the world can only solve the problems banking imposes upon us by restoring our right to issue unexploited promissory obligations. The story, therefore, unequivocally preaches a permanent eradication of banking. Now, you may all ask how I could possibly know the history of this event so well, and how I could understand what Franklin presents in this story so well. The reason is is it is actually very simple and it, it involves a story <clears throat> and before I get to that I should explain that I was deluged with material yesterday a uh, person quoted me back a few paragraphs of this parable uh, plagiarized by another person into a, a horridly simplistic, deviating account 
of some other person who is attempting to pretend they're some kind of monetary authority. And as I said earlier, there's some 25,400,000 pages, of the last I even looked, um, plagiarizing this story in my analysis of uh, Benjamin Franklin's um, Nature and Necessity of a Paper Currency, <clears throat> paper that he wrote in 1729 when he was 23 years old, quite some time before this event would have transpired. Why do I have a problem with this? <clears throat> the problem is is simple. Number one, each of these people purports that something else somehow solves the conditions which we are forced to solve if we are to prevail over the matter before us. If we fail to recognize what that matter is by inaccurately accounting for it, by failing to account for something which counts for something, by failing to resolve those into a simple singular solution, which is actually the case, all this is solved by an eradication of interest and an obligatory schedule of payment, retiring principal at the rate of consumption or depreciation of the related property. Period. That's it. No one has disproven that in 44 years. But every, every person under the sun who's got an ego large enough to replicate this story or further works of mine as if they realize these things and they, and they imply some different solution is nothing but an imposture. And how can I tell you why? <clears throat> I can tell you because, as I informed Ellen Hodge and Brown, uh, followers of my work uh, um, half a dozen years ago or so um, urged me to jump over to op-ed news and, and debate my proposition of mathematically perfected economy, which preceded her by, you know, 30 five years uh, you know, uh, online before others and I you know immediately engaged in this and uh, here in this very essay she'd written indeed she praised the uh, what she called the Pennsylvania currency as the most brilliant banking model in history the most brilliant banking model in history I asked her to qualify that and she couldn't cite a single principle why, how this would have solved the three categoric faults, which in the story, Franklin resolves. Two, being either volumetric or dispositional or a combination thereof, which thus equates to this literal expression of three categoric faults, which I've given for so long as one, inflation and deflation, which is volumetric. Two, systemic manipulation of the cost or value of money or property which is a combination of volumetric and dispositional and three inherent irreversible and therefore terminal multiplication of falsified indebtedness by interest which of course is maldisposition well how was I was able to explain this to Ellen Hodgson Brown who had read this story and was then even able unable even to put it into words. Well, she couldn't give us an answer why. And finally, after I'd frustrated her with a number of questions, vital questions, which proved that she had no authority on the matter whatsoever, I informed her that this is only a story. That these things never happened. Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin was sent to England for no such purpose ever. The words of the story are the words of Mike Montagna issued through the fictional mouth of Benjamin Franklin. Every site and every book such as I was informed yesterday, I have never read Ellen Hodgins' book. I have never held a copy of it in my hand. I was informed yesterday that she reproduces this very story as if she had dredged it up in history in her purported web of debt. What did she say in these debates we had with each other? <clears throat> 
She claimed to me that she didn't even see that interest is the problem. Can you imagine that? Stealing from work which prove, proves it is the problem one of two parts of a simple obfuscation of her currency. She was claiming that it wasn't a problem. She claimed you could spend it into circulation with a principal and that would solve the problem. But she couldn't show how. And do you know why she couldn't show how? Because how, after all, are you going to simply spend the interest into circulation? Why even would you when your uncovering or unraveling of the obfuscation proves interest is never unwarranted and when the a primary object of economy and monetary injustice is that we pay for something with an equal measure of our own production. Why increase that by imposing interest, especially for no purpose, if you're going to spend it into circulation? And where did she get this idea of spending money into circulation, which is what she's now advocating? Why would you avoid interest? Why would you eradicate interest and advocate spending money into circulation? And why are people claiming they've dug this up, that ancient China did, did, did this, and so on and so forth nowadays? Why have they gone so far? The reason is every plagiarist, once they heard that this was just a story, to cover their tracks, they looked for it somewhere else and, and, and pretended to dig it up in some other fact. Mathematically perfected economy has not existed in any other country of the world. In all of my research, except for possibly, possibly, in ancient Egypt, under the only common person in the entire thousands of years of ancient Egyptian history, who was ever deified, a man named Imhotep. Now the evidence of that is obscure and you can only understand it if you understood the obfuscation of the currency and mathematically perfected economy in the first place because otherwise the indications are absolutely meaning to it, meaningless to us. No one was saying before my work that, that, that uh, 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 Abraham Lincoln simply spent money into circulation. The only dialogue about that matter claimed that what he did was inflationary and some of my very first work proved that it wasn't any more inflationary than banking's obfuscation of our own currency. After all, advocating to spend the same money into cir circulation or loan the same money into circulation in terms of the definition of inflation, each are equally inflationary if there is any inflation at all. The problem is the banking forces us to pay what's put into circulation, plus all the interest on it, out of circulation. And so, to maintain a vital circulation the whole while, we only escalate debt at an ever-escalating rate. There's no even, there isn't even any evidence that I've ever crossed. And, and Lincoln is, excuse me, one of my most fo focused, you know, subjects of interest over all, all this while, but there's no evidence that, that Lincoln really understood that interest inherently multiplied falsified indebtedness into a terminal sum of falsified debt. He eloquently uh, elaborates on the basic abstract evil of banking, but he never resolves that. Neither does, neither does Jefferson. Well, in this f latest edition of of my parable, I've, I've I've attempted within its body and its unfinished work. I apologize for the repetitions, uh, but uh, uh, and there were parts that you know are unfinished and mangled and because of things that I was moving forward in the in the in the explanation from what still exists behind um, so it was rough reading for me as well but uh, the thing about this is is we need to understand what the problem is and what the solution is and what we have when, when, when all these people uh, merely pretend authority by, excuse me, stupidly, 
repeating what's merely a story as if they dredged it up in some purported research. When I'm the author of that story, when Benjamin Franklin never did any of these things, when all those innovations are my work issued through the fictional mouth of Benjamin Franklin, and they don't even know any better, these people, these people even have argued to me in public forums that Benjamin Franklin advocated spending money into circulation. And no, that's not the case at all. But there are two cases in this story, and this is what the meaning of the parable comes down to. In the first case, we're showing how the life cycle of promissory obligations rightfully replicates all the obligations of the matter at hand, whereas spending money into circulation is a different proposition. What is wrong with the latter? Well, the whole reason for the design of this story was this. It came, the original core of this story came from a lecture that I attended in Valdez, Alaska in 1975. I was invited as a special guest to come and attend. And the person who invited me would refuse to even tell me what the, what the lecture was about, except that it was about, you know, money systems. Uh, it was really about tax avoidance or evasion. And uh, it, was a, it, it was a surprisingly uh, uh, high-quality representation uh, in the way that the speaker handled different issues, except it left me it left it left me in a in a in a in a rather perplexed state. Here was my problem. <clears throat> there was a story given which is you know is far simpler than this account which I have just read. And um, as the speaker gave this account, I I. I I noted that he hadn't drawn together facts or precepts which amount to an understanding of principles which predicate whether these things were the right things to do. They sounded to the audience as if they were indeed perhaps better things to do, but There was no teaching of principles, and so at best we might just think, well, that sounds better. Why? Why should we do one thing or another thing or, or any permutation of any other thing? That's our problem, because if we can't unite on something, we have a huge issue. When the speaker finished his... Um, his presentation, um, he asked for questions, and uh, one thing had sort of led to another, and I had um, just decided at the last moment that I would go to this engagement because, well, of other events that broke out, and I was like five minutes late, and I didn't know if I was going to want to stay or even be associated with whoever I would eventually run into there, and I and I and the door was at the back of this auditorium, and I just slipped into uh, a seat in the unlit back. So when the speaker, it was a man named uh, Jacques Walker of Toronto, Canada, um, asked for questions at the conclusion of his presentation, um, I immediately raised my hand and I stood to ask him from the back of this huge room. I said, um, I should first explain <laughs> that uh, I, uh, I had, you know, uh, I wouldn't say that I'd done a terribly exhaustive study of history, but I found no real hint that anyone before me truly understood the principles that 
uh, basic mathematics resolve into a singular fact of mathematically perfected economy. I mean, um, Franklin, Jefferson, Adams, Madison, uh, Jackson, Lincoln, they d denounced banking. But they hadn't shown, I mean, they had indeed, you know, raised certain obtuse improprieties, but they hadn't, you know, got down to the meat of the matter and said, well, what else are we going to do? I mean, if you know what's wrong with something, then and then alone can you solve it. If you're just saying, well, this, these effects are bad, that's another thing. And that's what I saw because I had, as I given this account of uh, an economics class when I was 16, you know, proving that circulatory inflation was impossible if you collateralized debt. Therefore, circulatory inflation couldn't be the cause of rising prices and then prove, proving all in practically the same, you know, breath that uh, rising prices were in instead caused by a perpetual multiplication of falsified indebtedness by interest, which would further result in terminal, an inevitable terminal monetary failure. You know, I mean, this was my introduction. Um, uh, my, it was my contribution, which was a rebuttal of of a purported economic science, which of which none existed. And so I had gone through my life from then for some seven years. Well, I talked about mathematically perfected economy. I was constantly straightening people out from their misconceptions. Um, and that's why I was invited to this lecture. The The person had, you know, been complaining about, uh, you know, um, rising taxation. And I explain to him that he was complaining about the wrong thing that he had to we had to rectify the economy or the cost of government could only increase and taxes could only increase likewise so i explained mathematically perfected economy and this is why i was in, invited so as the speaker gave this uh uh presentation um i practically jumped out of my, my seat when um, he explained something that was similar to this with some holes in it and then gave these quotes which I did not make up uh, where Franklin I, I've, I've changed them since where Franklin ostensibly answers for the um, the uh, you know need to fund government and, and 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 all this or excuse me where he explains the cause of the revolution and the speaker further gave a quote of thomas jefferson which is all over the internet in millions of cases and it comes from my preservation of this lecture as well and that's where thomas jefferson um rebuts alexander Hamilton in the formative debates of our country. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was a representative of the bankers and he was advocating a central bank here. And in rebuttal to Hamilton, Jefferson had purportedly said, if the American people ever allow the banks to issue our currency, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations which will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake homeless on the continent their fathers had conquered. When the speaker said those words, it was all I could do not to jump out of my seat. I had looked for my thinking in history and I had failed to find it. And while this quote doesn't give it back exactly, Understanding it as I did, you could understand that this was likely the only thing that Jefferson could have meant. First by inflation and then by deflation. I just told you inflation is impossible. But it is possible, not as a cumulative effect. It is a fact, however, of a simultaneous process, which is this process of maldisposition that I've described, 
which is that we're paying principal and interest out of a circulation, that being deflation, and borrowing that back into circulation as a new debt equal to the former sum of debt plus the periodic interest that we've borrowed back as new debt, or inflation, or as I prefer to call it, reflation. This could be the only thing, if, if, if Jefferson was correct in what he had said, this could be the only thing that he could have meant. So there I was in the back of the auditorium at the end of this lecture, and I raised my hand and I said, uh, excuse me, and I stood up. I said, uh, you give this story and it's, um, it's, a, it's a very remarkable account. I'd, I'd uh, you know, I'm a student of history and I'd never crossed it before. It's extremely provocative. I was wondering a couple of things. I was wondering <clears throat> if what you had dis if you understood that what you prescribed was practically a mathematically perfected economy. And he began to frown already at me. I said, um, you explain how these two agricultural producers issue promissory obligations and how they're spent about the community. And then you give this quote of Thomas Jefferson, which I memorized on the spot. I mean, it was like I froze each phrase in time and it just implanted in the brain forever. And I gave the quote back to him. If, if the American people ever allow the banks to issue their currency, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations, which will grow up around them, will deprive the people of all property until their children wake homeless on the continent their fathers had conquered. I said, do you have any idea what that means? First by inflation and then by deflation? He frowned at me for quite some while and he finally shook his head. He said, no, I haven't the slightest idea. So I then explained the only thing that Jefferson could have meant was this idea of maldisposition, which of course manifests in inevitable terminal monetary failure. And then I explain how this idea of promissory obligations resolved all the issues because they came into existence as money was needed to represent property in exact proportion to the property and were retired from existence in accord with consumption or expiration of the property itself. I had no idea what I was talking about. He practically immediately invited me to the point podium to join him and, and we spoke for to the wee hours of the morning without a single person leaving the audience to understand this idea of mathematically perfected economy. But that was the first time in my life that I had heard that someone else in history might have had the same idea, which I've given you the account of when you conjuring this suddenly in response to this proposition that circulatory inflation causes price inflation in this economics class that I'm attending when I'm only 16 years old. Well, <clears throat> I left my job in Alaska because it was a um, government subsidized cost plus contract. The most corrupt thing that you can imagine being involved with. And um, I had all kinds of problems with my employer, including failure to supply any paychecks. <clears throat> uh, 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 room and board was supposed to be free. Uh, you know, when we left a job, the job was supposed to be $2,000 a week. It was $1,150 a week. The room and board was about $150 a week. You're down to 1000 out of what you were supposed to get was 2000 Uh The federal government, I was single. The federal government took 550 bucks a week out of that. And that left you 450 The state of Alaska took 175 a week out of that. So that's down to three fifty two two seventy five um no excuse me one one hundred and seventy five dollars a week um I don't know it yet, but when I returned to California uh the state of California because I didn't stay in Alaska for six months is going to take another hundred and seventy five dollars a week out of, out of my paycheck 
which is going to leave me with zero. I paid for my own cost of getting up there and getting back. And uh, every week and uh, on the paycheck stub of every person in this 3,000 man work camp at Terminal Camp in Valdez, Alaska, every week there's a, 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 a box on the left side of a tearaway paycheck stub. Uh, the title of the box is Voluntary Deductions. No one ever came around and asked you, do you want to make a donation for this, a donation for that? So everywhere, every week the box was, was filled with entries like this. Valdez Sheriff Fund, $50. Valdez Bus Fund, $25. Valdez School Fund, $25. <laughs> So I was actually working in Alaska for negative money, but not only that, the first several weeks they were there, I never got a paycheck. And when I finally did get a, my first paycheck after being there for five and a half weeks, it was $450. Now, uh, I've never been paid for the time that I work in Alaska, if you want to call it work. It wasn't work. And they hired 10 welders for every welding machine. And if you began a weld, your leads would disappear and you wouldn't find them for another week. Um, anyway, be all that as it may, we were ordered to work, you know, uh, act like we were working one day a week for the feds to come and shoot video of the whole affair. And I can show you to this very day from the very videos that they would take, I can actually prove to you. I made all these observations while I was there. So any of those videos, from those videos today, we can prove that those men, in fact, are not working. Everyone hammering on something. I was I was ordered to, for instance, I worked in the power and vapor unit, and I was uh, probably the most technically demanding welding work there. Uh, I worked on all the super heated super high velocity steam lines that feed the steam turbines that generated all the power for the plant. And I was ordered um, one day to, uh, in front of the cameras, to stand before a fitting. Now all these fittings are chromium alloy pipe and the ends are beveled uh, by machines and they're perfect. You know, they they match perfectly and there's all these sequences and there's heat treating and then normalization of, of, of the weldman area and all this that goes on in this super high chromium alloy material, <clears throat> which is resistant to erosion of this superheated steam. Anyway, you never hit a pipe with a hammer. There are uh, precautions for preheating a well before you begin on it. There's there are precautions for allowing it to cool very slowly when you're finished with it and so on and so forth. The last thing you would ever do would be to bash a weld or a fitting with a heavy sledgehammer. And I was ordered one day to uh, take a vernier caliper and pretend that I was bashing the end of this fitting into perfect roundness. I told the superintendent of the job site, who was the one who ordered me to do this, that no way over my dead body <laughs> would anyone ever film me of doing such a preposterously stupid thing. And so he said, well, that's your job for the day. And I said, well, that's my last minute of work. And then I was forbid to even go get my paycheck. They had rules. You can't even walk across the job site. I violated job site regulations to do this. And then they, they sent a half a dozen cars after me to, to arrest me all the way into Valdez. The bus driver had me hide behind a seat in the back, which I crawled on my hands and knees without ever touching my muddy feet to the ground. The, the police stopped the bus, looked on the bus, didn't even see a hint that anybody had got back there because the bus had just been cleaned. <laughs> and yet I was on the floor in the back the whole while, and we resumed our story, and this bus driver cashed my last check, bought my airplane ticket, took me to a door on the side of the airport. We finished the story, which he thought was great, and he showed me this side door to go in, and I'd be able to get right on my flight. And sure enough, all of it was exactly true, and I was out of Alaska. And that's how I left without ever... with without ever sealing a way to continue 
you know, any kind of correspondence with this man who had given this lecture. So that's how I lost track of this person. So anyway, what I did is I spent the next quite many years uh, telling this story faithfully, as it was, and likewise, um, researching in libraries without any ability to find it. I never scored. I struck out. There was no evidence that this ever happened. I'm wondering, God, this guy, you know, winked during the presentation. Did this really ever happen? But at the same time, I'm a, I'm a, uh, a first cousin, six generations removed from uh, Thomas McKeon, who was, uh, you know, the uh, second president of the United States in the pre-constitutional era after the revolution. So uh, I'm a descendant of the McKeon clan in Scotland and Ireland and and uh, Thomas McKeon was a close friend of uh, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. In family lore, however true it may or may not have been, uh, was that the family possessed all these letters between, you know, Franklin and, or Jefferson and, and Washington and uh, Thomas McKeon, who we were proud to be related to, of course. And uh, that's all I knew about that. Uh, uh, the thing about that, though, that, registered in my mind since I was a young child is that, you know, I mean, here were these letters in family archives and, uh, you know, evidently they didn't belong to any museum, no historian had ever, you know, brought them into the, you know, the public for, uh, you know, of accredited history or whatever, but that doesn't mean, of course, that they don't exist. But I've been speaking, I've been faithfully giving this account in many ways and times, um, and it had proven to be an, 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 an just an incredibly excellent vehicle for, for presenting mathematically perfected economy. And then all of a sudden one day I, I get a letter from a, a professor of, uh, at the University of Virginia. And he's asking uh, politely that uh, I disclose my sources for these uh, quotes, the quote of Jefferson, I've never changed from what I originally heard, but I have um, slightly embellished uh, Franklin's explanation of, of uh, the real reason we fought the revolution. And what you don't realize is, is that back in the early 90s, I had 100,000 people a month coming to my web pages and, 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 and the plagiarism just took off. I mean, one site alone reproduced all my work 18,000 times over. And then uh, Jock Jakerin wrote me shortly on the heels of that and wanted to know this, that, and the other thing. And he was kind of a, a jerk. You know, to tell you the truth, an arrogant, insistent guy, and I, you know, and I, I, I gave him some poor answers on purpose because, you know, I wanted to feel the situation out before I disclosed so much as he wished, which required much of my time, and and it was really quite disrespectfully, disrespectfully, you know, presented. I didn't care for the guy. So next thing you know, a year later, his debt virus comes out, and from the very first page of it, he reproduces this story I had been telling since 1975, but which, after I got this um, this uh, this letter from this professor from the University of Virginia, which of course Thomas Jefferson had co-founded. He was a founder of the university. Um, the man who introduced himself is probably the world's leading expert on Jefferson material. And he claimed that so far as he knew, Jefferson had never said such a thing. 
he wasn't as much an expert on Franklin. <clears throat> uh, but he believed Franklin probably never said the same things either. And I thought, and why would anyone even assert that, especially when you can read so much that they did say, um, and Lincoln said, and Jackson said, as opposed to banking? Is it possible they never figured out really exactly what banking's crimes were? Is it possible that just by accident, this man who didn't understand what the quote meant, yet had given it to it to me? I couldn't conceive that he had made it up. What was the source of this? Where did it come from? Well, I faithfully explain what my sources were, that they were just this lecture and this professor advises me not to repeat the story that unless it can be corroborated, it's false. Well, I thought, I said, well, that's not true, you know, that it's false just because you haven't heard of it, just because you haven't held an account of it in your hand doesn't mean that it never existed either. And I knew that well to be a fact because if my family possessed letters, which had never been, you know, introduced to historical archives, we have a perfect you know, case of it, you know. I mean, it was equally arrogant for him to say that you know, it can't, can't ever have existed. Nonetheless, I was troubled by this. Why? Because my interest is perfect integrity in my work, perfect accountability in my work. I don't call my work mathematically perfected economy as some you know, casual, you know, uh, or, 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 provocative metaphor you know so uh, I thought about this I was quite troubled with it I couldn't use this story as a teaching device well about 1980 what I did is I decided well heck with it if Franklin never said this and Jefferson never said that and this story never transpired the original core story I'll call it a parable I'll make it a parable I'll make it just a story and then I'll take literary license to speak through Franklin and to make the story whatever I need it to be to teach people what they need to learn. And so the story became a completely preposterous um, obfuscation itself of what had originally been said in order to convey this idea of mathematically perfected economy. Well, how do all these people plagiarize this then? <clears throat> and what authority do they have if they do so? Well, what happened after <laughs> Jacobin produces this debt virus and uh, somebody sends me, you know, quotes of the first page, which is like a it's just an amateurish attempt to to imitate my work with a, what was a historic what, what was presented as if it was a historic account but which wasn't an historic account at all which had been changed into mathematically perfected economy to present mathematically perfected economy to the fiction through the fictional mouth of Benjamin Franklin <laughs> so Jakerson, J Jake Rand does a, a, a childish job of, of obfuscating this story, you know, into a, an account of, him, of his own of a similar kind, which loses the whole thread in a book he calls The Debt Virus, which only steals my thesis of inevitable monetary failure, which he can't even articulate. And no one has articulated since. And that's the real thing, <laughs> which is so important about understanding this story now is that everyone who's re reproduced it, Ellen Hodgson Brown, you know, Tommy Usury Free up in Canada, you know, this guy, I, I get an email around, I don't know, 1997 or 8 or so, and somebody says, I think you better look at this, you know, and I go and here's this guy giving excerpts of my story, but they're, again, it's like a fifth grade history project. He's ruined the, the, the whole purpose of this story, mainly 
to avoid to try to avoid being tech, detected for plagiarizing, not even realizing that by repeating the story at all, he's plagiarizing because it's not history. It's a story that I wrote. In the end, it's a story that I wrote. You see. So anyway, I notify him of this, and he doesn't even respond to me. A few years later, I run into the guy in another forum, and he posts to, you know, something that I've explained perfectly and conclusively. Well, if you really want to understand this, visit my site. Here's a link to my pages, you know, kind of thing. And it's Tommy, Tommy Usery Free again. And so... Uh, I reminded him that he'd plagiarized my work. I publicly embarrassed him. <clears throat> a few years, a few more years go by. Produced my YouTube video. Everybody wanted me to explain it, so I did. It's graphic. <laughs> Nobody even cares, you know. And so, guess who's one of the first people to post to it? A guy named Usery Free. And what does he pose? If you really want to understand it, visit my pages. I wrote him back. I says, aren't you that Tommy Usury Free up in Canada who's been selling my parable of perfect economy since 1997 or whatever it is? He was actually producing, uh, you know, hand-printed copies of his printer, stapling them together and selling them for 35 bucks or something like that. That was the price. So, what does he say? This is the third time he's done this to me. What does he say to me in reply? Well, that's the first time I've ever heard of it. Unquote. Exact words. What does that mean? That's the first time I ever heard of it. What does that mean? You know, if you had actually dug that story up from history, what you would have is a source that you could cite faithfully. Mine was a lecture for which there was no historic corroboration of the purported facts. I never found one. I looked my damnedest. Asked librarians to help me. We never turned up anything. It was a lost cause. A professor finally tells me, no, it never happened. Jefferson never said that. Yes, he did say some similar things, but no, not that. And I explained how it was even perfectly true. And he says, nonetheless, there's no indication that Jefferson ever realized such a thing. And I'm thinking, holy shit, I'm back to square one. It's like I'm the only one in the world who understood this. And all these people, Ellen Hodgson Brown, Tommy Usery Free, are what? They're pretending to be authorities, selling my work, making a pile of money off of it, in the case of some people, and not even understanding it, and denouncing me in public, first of all, ignoring I even exist, because I'm the source of the most important parts of their work. And then denounce, denying that interest is even the problem. And then years later, advocating spending money into circulation, which, lo and behold, is an absence of interest. Hmm. And how does it solve anything? Does she provide a principle or a precept which resolve solution from spending money into circulation? I mean, my God, people, a, per a person that does even just the least math is going to realize, oh my God, if you had to spend all the money into circulation, you have to create a government as big as all of our industry and commerce merely to do that. When you could do the same by allowing the people to issue their own promissory obligations, and then it's all automatically retiring from circulation as it should with those who are consuming whatever they are, paying for what they consume and no more and no less. You're obvious, you're, 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 you're taking monetary injustice and doing something else just because you don't understand how it is that interest causes the effects that they do, nor how to solve that. And so all these people, in truth, have only registered a trail that they're imposters, every one of them. Now, 
If I sound arrogant to you that I'm saying that, and yet it's a fact that those words of Benjamin Franklin indeed are my words, I have records of writing the original essay. I have records of, of publishing it 30 years before these people even thought of doing any monetary work. You know? And I'm arrogant for pointing them out to you. Here's the thing. If you don't understand who's full of it and who isn't full of it, we can go on like this forever. And that's the problem we all have. So that's the reason for this story. You know, you can either go on through your life like everything is a multiple choice question. And at first there was A, B, and C, and D. Though the original guy that all these people are proposing A, B, and C, D exist, they stole from a guy who proved it was A and A only. So it gets to A, B, C, and D. And then everybody else who plagiarizes those guys, because that same story that came from my work still sounds good enough to them that they're just going to convert it into something else. And now 16 people who plagiarize each of those four claim it's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. Oh, God, we've got multiple choice, and we can just, you know, with that. None of these people can prove an alternate solution. And if you look at their work, Read it carefully, every page. You won't find it. People say that I've made it too complicated. It is what it is. An explanation of it, which explains what it is, is the only explanation that can serve us. Did Ellen Hodge and Brown serve you by saying it's a Ponzi scheme? that we can just spend the interest into circulation, which she's now backed off from and is claiming as if it's her own idea. But notice, ladies and gentlemen, the idea comes from this story. Now she's advocating spending money into circulation. Why well, I used to pack the house when I spoke about, gave this presentation. And when I was finished with it, <clears throat> you see, part of contriving it is there wasn't an answer for that question. How would you support government with this, <laughs> what, what they call script? Well, so I invented that answer, and I purposely made it conflict with the first account of the two agricultural pr producers. Why did I do that? The reason I did that is because when I finished the story, ever, I mean, I had people weep over this thing. When I would finish it, the entire audience would just be, you know, there were there were there were rarely any detractors, and the entire audience would just be uh, mesmerized that they had ser been served a piece of history which, of course, didn't even exist, because I turned this into a parable in about 1980, and it's been a parable. You know, ever since. And since it became a parable, it became a whole different critter than it started out as. And so what would happen is when I would finish the story, though people thought it was better, they didn't understand the principles, which I had very carefully articulated. And we would have these huge discussions where we would go through things and people would yawn out and they would lose the train of thought. And, you know, it was too much for them. What did I do this for? What happened is I went through my mind of all the scenarios of how to get this all explained without repeating myself. And that's why I put the second example in there. Because it purports to gloriously solve the issue of funding government without any cost at all to the people. But that's not true. It does improve, impose a cost upon us. It imposes a cost of inflation, which makes a competition of the money, the greater circulation for the production, cause prices to change, can cause prices to change in an upward fashion, which then persists afterward, 
And so you actually can pay the cost more than you would if you just paid for whatever government you needed. And if you don't need the government, you know, and you can't get a free lunch anyway, what's the point of doing it that way? There isn't any. You know, it costs you at least as much as it does as it, if you pay for it as you would. So I thought, that's funny. I th That's my sense of humor. I mean, I thought that was funny. I would plant that in the story as the greatest answer that Benjamin Franklin could give, which is, of course, myself, that I could give to this question that England was, you know, imposing upon me. You know, answer this, young fella, you dumb... <laughs> imposter you know you couldn't possibly you know fund government with this and I said oh yes we can and this is how we do it and the audience would just be going whoa that's great <laughs> but it's wrong the idea of putting that in the story was that so we would have to come back and explain that and now because I was taking away the temptation of doing that, the phenomenal solution that people thought they had just heard, I was taking it away from them. I got all the focus you can imagine at the end of my presentation. So I'd finish the story as I just did, and uh, I would stand there, and the audience would just be oh, thinking so hard. They would be in, in shock that they never understood this from their own history, and that they didn't indeed been prescribed this way to do things right and no wonder we were in all the trouble at the time and I mean in 1980 ladies and gentlemen we had double digit prime rates that's what the Federal Reserve charged you know for just printing the money you know 14 percent prime rates and upwards of that even you know that's what member banks of the Federal Reserve had to pay to borrow quote unquote borrow the money from the the publisher, you know, I mean, my God, I mean, things were really going bad in a handbag, and anybody paying any attention could see it all. We were feeling it in extreme ways. So now, um, here they were, they had the presentation, and they would sit there, you know, in, in awe, I mean, speechless, you know, and uh, I would just allow them to sit in that state for several sentences, and a lot of I would study the audience, as I say Franklin does, and I would, you know, catch the, the eye of quite a few people. And I mean, people would give me signs and shake their head, you know, incredulous, incredulously and whatever. And finally, I would say, just matter of factly, I would say, now what is wrong with this story? <laughs> and they, they would jump in their seats and they would think, oh, no. Where is he taking us now? And I would ex I would start to explain. I said, well, you've been given two cases here, and none of you have realized the difference. The meaning of this story, and I would explain that promissory obligations were the natural life cycle of currency. And then in this second example, why I have government being funded without taxation, didn't exist at all. You're all familiar with the you know, the expression taxation without representation. Are any of you aware that government was, was funded without taxation? No. You can't be. Because it didn't happen. And people would start to fidget in their seats and think that, you know, I had no cre credibility, that I couldn't possibly say that. And then I would explain the reason it didn't happen is this is just a story of which I am the author and that I have just spoken my own words through the fictional mouth of Benjamin Franklin. The problem with funding government by spinning money into circulation is that you would have to have a government as large as the circulation which is to sustain all of our industry and commerce absolutely without necessity because basically, except for defense, pretty much all that a government does is decide what infrastructures we need and then finance them by the first example, which avoids inflation and assigns the cost, as there's no free lunch, to those who should rightly pay for them. So that's what taxation with representation is.
It's associating the cost with those who should rightfully pay for it. So that's the truth about mathematically perfected economy. The first example is the solution. The second deviates from it. Well, <laughs> how did all these people stumble into this then? After Jake Rann, uh plagiarized me, what I did was I removed the explanation from the end of the document that I had online. And now no one knew that it was a parable anymore, although it said parable of perfect economy, and though the introductory paragraphs did imply this was just a story. But if you wanted to believe it with all you were worth, regardless that it wasn't history at all, you might. And so did Ellen Hodgson Brown, Stephen Zarlinga, Bill Still. You know, the list is huge. And that's the story of parable of mathematically perfected economy. Thanks again for listening. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak again. I'm going to be busy. I'm going to have to return to working on this website and, and getting things done. Um, if I may conclude again uh, with the words of a, a good Native American friend of mine. And we are all related. Good night.